So I just want to uh, discuss for really a couple of minutes about hierarchical design or how we deal with a really big chip. So there's a question of flat versus hierarchical design, which I brought up before. If the design is too big, what we're going to do is we're going to partition it into hierarchy. So we take the full chip design and we decide that the net list should be broken up into different basically modules or blocks. And each one of them we're going to um, do a place and route flow separately. So we have block one, we do a place and route two, block flow two, a place and route flow block three a place in our outflow we close the these designs separately and then we connect them all together for full tip uh, full chip timing and verification so the advantages are very clear we get a faster runtime to do the place and route flow of this uh, partition is much faster than doing the whole chip at once um, we need less me memory for EDA tools we need less runtime uh, in fact we need fewer licenses Okay, um, if we need to make an ECO, an ex engineering change order, the turnaround time is much faster to do it on a, a smaller block than doing it on the whole chip over again. And we can do design reuse. So if we did this place and route flow on this block, we can take this block as is and take it to a different chip. Okay, um, so we can see uh, one of our, our chips over here that has all these different uh, blocks. Maybe these are IPs that were maybe analog or external, maybe some hard IPs, but these are all different blocks that uh, we placed and routed separately, and then we just connect them together by making uh, making the routes that go between them in these different routing channels, or are there different approaches to doing this? So what are the disadvantages of doing this? Well, it's much more difficult for full chip timing closure, and I'll discuss in a second what an ILM is. Um, there's more intensive design planning needed. We need to think about how we made this chip from the beginning. We may have these types of feed-throughs. For example, let's say um, that this is the, the, the clock pin, or this is uh, maybe this is a pin that gives a voltage that goes over to here, over to here. So um, are we going to go around and run around the chip like that? Or are we going to go over here where this uh, route actually has to pass through these other hierarchies? Um, so that's kind of called a feed through. Um, we need to add all kinds of repeaters on such a line to make sure that our uh, our voltage that our um, signals are passed um, the right way, and we need to decide on the timing budgeting and budgeting, um, which we'll discuss in a second. So, what is this time budgeting? So, when we were discussing um, timing, what we said is that our life actually lives um, in this area. So that's what we know. We know about our flip-flop and we know that there's an input to our uh, block and there's some sort of a, a logic block here and we know that we want to optimize this logic block according to our constraint. But since we, we don't know what our actual um, frequency is or so forth, what we're going to do is often we're going to assume that there's some sort of flip-flop living outside the chip here that, and we say that it has some sort of amount of time that it can um, that it can consume over here until um, we go into the chip. So how we do that is with an interface constraint such as a set input delay. And that was what we knew before. Um, if this is the uh, border of our chip, we don't know what's going to be connected out here. We have to meet some sort of standard that um, defines what our hold and setup delays outside the chip are. But when we're talking about hierarchical design, this is we, we're going to eventually know about this flip-flop, about this uh, logic cloud, and about the skew between the clock nets, because it's going to be the same clock that gets into both places. So um, what happens is when we combine all of these together, we're going to get this really, really complex model that's going to have you know millions of paths and gates and so forth inside and the thing is that we know that the the path from here to here which was inside our block we already made sure this met timing we we knew about everything inside here right this reg to, this was a reg to reg path not an interreg path so for example this path and this path they're completely taken care of and it's it's redundant to check it again once we combine the the full chip um, design so what we can do is we can actually just take these paths and remove them and delete them um, and make a model that just includes these interreg and reg to out and into out paths. That's called an ILM. So that's a type of a um, timing model that we use for uh, accurate timing of higher of top level um, hierarchical design. Okay, another in, in, another issue is pin assignment. So pin constraints include parameters such as layer spacing, size, overlap, net groups, and pin guys. What that means is that we have 
our blocks over here and we have to decide on the floor plan of each one of these blocks separately where we're going to actually put the pins because the pin is just a piece of metal that our final driver or our initial input is going to connect to so it could be anywhere it's very different than making the io constraints of where these big huge pads are it's just a little piece of metal so how do we decide and there there are two ways i mean if we're doing this bottom-up design for instance if we made a macro that uh, we're going to reuse in several places then we arbitrarily or according to where we want our modules we're going to be placed we uh, scattered the pins in a certain area but uh, that's not very good because that puts a constraint on our uh, higher level if we're actually making for example these four blocks what well, the the top level floor planning can do some sort of a an initial type of a route and see that um, there are nets that connect between all these places so if there are these nets why don't we line up our uh, pins so the connections are trivial between the two blocks and so we should do that um, we can do it with pin guides or all kinds of uh, assignment tools that we have inside the place and route tools so pin guides can be used to, to to make sure that our pins go to certain areas and we can align them in a top-down flow and so forth feed throughs so I mentioned for for a minute that there's something uh, about feed throughs first of all if we have channel less designs or uh, with limited channel resources or we don't want to route through the channel we may have this thing called a feed through which also makes our life a bit more difficult so we have some sort of IO pin and this net has to go all the way over to this partition C um, so what we're gonna do is we're this net doesn't even appear inside the net list of partition a um, and this net and this net don't appear inside the net list of partition B. So what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to feed them through partition A and partition B. There are several ways to do that. So we can just add, push down into the net list uh, ports here um, and a wire that connects these two ports, right? Um, uh, that is one way to do it. Another way is to pre-route this type of a thing uh, of a net inside the floor plan and put blockage uh, make it fixed so it won't be removed um, do that by pushing it down from the top level in it uh, but th there is another problem let's say we want to do some sort of optimization such as adding a buffer inside here we can't do that then we have to push the net down into the net list and that allows us the possibility of actually say buffering one of these nets inside a partition where the net doesn't actually exist Okay, so that's another kind of a headache that we have to deal with when we're dealing with hierarchical design. So that was all I wanted to say about hierarchical design, and it leads me to the Chip Hall of Fame. Um, so when we're talking about floor plans and even hierarchical design or mini little blocks, uh, one of the most essential attributes of the FPGA is the floor plan, and I wanted to mention the first FPGA, the Xilinx XC2064. And here's a picture of the floor plan over here on the right-hand side. Um, so Ross Freeman, who was the CEO of Xilinx, he bet on Moore's Law um, that it was going to make transistors so cheap that you could waste them. And remember, we looked before at the, 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 uh, the pad-limited type of design where we had a lot of wasted area. Well, Moore's Law uh, allowed that to happen because transistors got so small, they're actually really cheap. And sometimes things like routing resources become more expensive than them or maybe IOs. So... Uh, um, so Ross Freeman he bet on that happening he said we could just put a lot of these uh, types of pre uh, manufactured gates onto a chip and we won't use a good large part of them but it'll be enough and it'll give us this uh, this option of reconfigurability that makes the FPGAs so uh, great today so it was uh, the, this chip was released in uh, 1985 it was made in a 2 micron process it had 64 logic cells and flip-flops and 38 IO pins they called it a logic cell array it, it was the program logic was done completely by hand they didn't have a synthesis or a place and route type of a uh, tool such as a uh, Vivado or or one of the other tools for implementing FPGAs um, and another just important point here that Xilinx was the worst world's first fabless IC vendor so now it's kind of given I mean you have Qualcomm or Marvell or um, Apple or Amazon they're all fabless IC vendors only uh, companies such as Intel actually have their own foundry inside uh, their their house. Most of uh, the companies we we work with are are fabless, but in those days, all of the companies had their own fabs. And Xilinx was the first one that actually sent their chip to a different place that had a fab and made it for them. 